on the path to becoming a great clinician, you have to be a pathology superhero. It's important to learn about vascular diseases because they will help you treat and counsel patients with important and common diseases like heart attacks and strokes. In this lecture on vascular disease, we're first going to think about atherosclerosis. These are the key concepts to remember in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. Chronic endothelial injury leads to endothelial dysfunction and increased permeability. Lipids come in through the endothelium and are deposited in the intima where they're ingested by macrophages. The macrophages then release cytokines which lead to the migration of smooth muscle cells into the intima with the formation of the classic plaque. The macrophages then break down and release fats which become cholesterol crystals. This picture illustrates what I've just been talking about. The endothelium is on the top. It's injured and leaky, letting fats through into the intima. You can see they've been broken down by the macrophages because they're forming cholesterol crystals. The macrophages are those blue cells that we see. The smooth muscle that underlies the blue internal elastic lamina has migrated to over the top of the plaque forming the fibrous cap. Another key concept is that of stable and unstable plaques. Stable plaques have a very thick fibrous cap, a little lipid and minimal inflammation. They're associated in the coronary arteries with stable angina. Unstable or vulnerable plaques have a very thin cap that can easily rupture and release large amounts of central lipid and inflammation, causing blood clots. They're associated with unstable angina and myocardial infarction. The concept is illustrated in this illustration. On the left, we have the unstable plaque. It's got a very, very thin fibrous cap easy to rupture and let all that lipid out into the bloodstream causing a thrombogenic process. The right hand plaque is much more stable. That thick fibrous cap isn't going anywhere. The lipid core is very small and there's very little inflammation. So how does atherosclerosis occlude an artery? There are several ways. Firstly, as I've mentioned, plaque can rupture with expulsion of atheromatous debris and then a thrombus forms. Secondly, the fibrous cap itself can be damaged and a thrombus formed. Bleeding into the plaque can blow it up like a balloon, a rapid expansion in the size of the plaque and then this very slow progressive plaque growth that can include an artery. These processes are illustrated on the right. So at the top, we've got a rupture of a plaque. Sometimes the wall underneath an atherosclerotic plaque becomes so weak that it can rupture outwards as well as inwards. Thrombi can occlude an artery. Imagine that presenting as a really sudden myocardial infarction. And then there's a slow accumulation which would present a stable angina, which gets worse and worse and worse until finally there is a critical stenosis. Now let's move on to think about aneurysms and dissections. These are critical diseases in which patients have only minutes or hours to be saved. These are the key concepts in aortic aneurysms. The first is that the pathogenesis of proximal and distal aortic aneurysms differs. Proximal aneurysms are predominantly caused by hypertension, whereas distal aneurysms are predominantly caused by atherosclerosis. Dissecting aneurysms occur when high pressure blood extends through an intimal tear and then spreads between the layers of the media, often over the aortic arch and down into the descending aorta. 
Hypertension causes degeneration of the elastic media in the aorta. The pictures on the right illustrate how in a normal aorta, the elastin is really linear, very stretchy, like an elastic band. But with time and hypertension, these elastic layers become disrupted. You can see in the lower part of the picture that they really don't form a coherent elastic band anymore. Thus, the aorta will stretch and form an aneurysm. Here the picture illustrates a dissecting aneurysm. We have the black layers of the elastin in the artery spread apart by blood dissecting between the layers. It's caused by hypertension and aided by atherosclerosis of the small vessels that feed into the aortic wall. These are called the vasovasorum. Ischemia and degeneration of the media caused by the relative lack of oxygen because of the atherosclerosis of the vasovasorum leads to an increased likelihood that the elastin layers will degenerate and be subject to a dissecting aneurysm. Let's think about the abdominal aortic aneurysm now. The primary cause of this is atherosclerosis, but where it happens mostly just below the renal arteries is because there's a lot of turbulence in that area, further weakening the wall. Hypertension also plays a part as it increases the degeneration in the media. And then there's a genetic predisposition in about 20% of patients to getting abdominal aortic aneurysms. This picture to the right illustrates an abdominal aortic aneurysm which has become filled up with layered blood clot. You can see its position is between the renal arteries and the bifurcation of the aorta. Then there are multiple layers forming what we call Zahn's lines as blood clot fills it up. Think what's going to happen to that blood clot. It might well embolize and cause ischemia further down the arterial tree. Finally, in this segment, we're going to think about vasculitis. There are a couple of common types of, types of vasculitis that you need to know about, and many, many rarer kinds that we really don't need to know specifically about. Key concepts in vasculitis. Most vasculitis is of immune origin. The vessels are injured by immunoglobulins depositing in the walls an activating complement. Different types of vasculitis affect different size vessels. The two types of vasculitis seen most frequently are temporal arteritis and hypersensitivity vasculitis. Temporal arteritis affects older people, more women than men. It affects the temporal and other head arteries. It causes occlusion and in particular retinal artery occlusion will cause blindness. If we biopsy a temporal artery, which is how it's diagnosed, it shows granulomatous inflammation in the wall, indicating that somewhere in there there is a type 4 immune reaction to elastin. In these pictures of a lady with temporal arteritis, you can see her temporal artery standing out. It's become thickened and will be quite tender to palpation. And then there's a narrow area where it's quite occluded and fibrosed. If we look down the microscope, the top right picture points to an area of granulomatous inflammation. Look really closely, you'll be able to see giant cells. Further down, the lower right picture shows that the elastic lamina of the artery has become disrupted and destroyed by this inflammation. Also notice how the intima is now thickened and thus the lumen is narrowed. This artery can then develop a thrombus in it and become occluded. Hypersensitivity vasculitis, also known as leukocytoclastic vasculitis, is also caused by an immune reaction. 
It happens in people older than 16 years of old and is often associated with either use of a medicine or the presence of infection that triggers this immune reaction. Biopsy of the skin rash shows neutrophils around a small vessel. It doesn't just happen in the skin. It can happen in the kidneys, GI tract and joints, giving a wide range of symptoms. It's IgG deposition in the walls of capillaries that leads to this immune vasculitis. On the right, we can see the classic clinical appearance of hypersensitivity vasculitis. They get palpable purpura, those red spots, which feel lumpy and raised. And when we look down the microscope at the skin, gosh, what a lot of inflammatory cells there are. They've disrupted vessels, letting those red cells spill out. And at the same time, the neutrophils are breaking down, giving rise to nuclear dust and attracting more inflammatory cells. This brings us to the end of our consideration of vascular diseases, atherosclerosis, which underlies MI and stroke, aneurysms and dissections that can cause sudden death in patients, and vasculitis, often the mystery, but two common ones, temporal artery and hypersensitivity vasculitis. Thank you for joining me on this pathology journey, where you will become a pathology superhero and learn to treat your patients better.